The Lord be with you, beloved pillar community, worshiping in this online way. It's so good to be together. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors at Pillar. It's such a gift to imagine all of the different places you are, the different experiences you have, the different journeys with God you're on. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of that journey with you. We're coming from lots of different places, not just geographically, but spiritually and emotionally, too. My friend Danny Carpenter, a Western Theological Seminary student and pastoral fellow at Pillar, is going to bring greetings, and then the ensemble will lead us. The Lord be with you, Pillar community. My name is Danny Carpenter, and I am a college ministries intern here at Pillar. Today, we gather to sing, to pray, hear God's word, and to gather around his table so that we might be a sign, instrument, and foretaste of the kingdom of God in Christ Jesus, who is making all things new. Let's join together in worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All my inmost being, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and do not forget all of his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and compassion. We join with these words from the psalmist this morning as we worship. Let's continue in singing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Again, hear these words. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all of his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with steadfast love and compassion. 
The witness of the Bible and the church continually blesses God for his good and gracious gifts of forgiveness, healing, and redemption. And is there anyone among us today that could name a place, a situation, a relationship that is in desperate need of healing, forgiveness, or redemption? We all feel this in so many different ways, both personally and in the world around us. So as we pray this morning, we're going to come before God and ask again for his mercy, healing, forgiveness. And as we do, we'll use ancient words of the Christian faith, Kyrie eleison, which means Lord have mercy. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the one who, by your grace, offers us forgiveness, healing, and redemption. In all the ways that we fall short because of sin, forgive us. In all the places where our bodies and spirits are broken, heal us. In every corner of the world where violence destroys, where abuse exists, where people are hurting, bring redemption. And Lord, kindle in us the light of Jesus that can never be extinguished, so that through all of our lives, we might offer the same forgiveness and grace to others that you freely give to us. God, with all that's within us, we bless your name. Have mercy on us, Lord. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. Christ who died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Believe this good news and be at peace. Let's keep singing. Alleluia. Oh uh-huh. 
we experience God's forgiveness, healing, and redemption today, even as we long for that great day when Christ comes again to make all things new and justice prevails and peace covers the whole earth. So let's respond by singing, Justice Will Roll Down. Friends, this is the future that Christ offers us, a future where justice prevails and peace covers the earth, the peace of Christ. But until that day, we operate as peacemakers and peacekeepers in Jesus' name with all that we do, all our lives, our work, our relationships in this community, and also as a community at Pillar together. There are plenty of things to be attentive to and involved with in the coming weeks and months as we continue to kick off a fall ministry season. We invite you to continue to check out the website, the Mission and Ministry Opportunities button, as well as our weekly email, uh, email office at Pillar Church if you'd like to get signed up for that. 
Uh, we will continue to worship at our Warehouse 6 location at 10 o'clock on Sundays, which launches today and will continue uh, throughout the fall. Uh, as you are comfortable and able to worship in person, we invite you to check out the warehouse. Uh, we would love to see you there uh, as we worship together there at 10 o'clock on Sundays. But for now, uh, we again have the privilege of celebrating the sacrament of baptism. Uh, we have a video from last week. Uh, we'd like you to watch that now. Elsie, it was for you that Christ came into the world. It was for you that he died. It was for you that he rose again, even though you may know so little of it now. We love because God first loved us. So, Elsie, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can we celebrate with Elsie, please? Should we try? We're going to try this. Not no. so much. <laughs> We're not going to try this. <laughs> can, can we walk Elsie down this way? So we have this practice at Pillar. Claiming a verse based on the meaning of the name of the one baptized. Uh, Elsie has a very beautiful name. It means God is an oath. Or God is a promise. So I wondered if we could claim this promise for Elsie from uh, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, help you, uphold you with my victorious right hand. Can we claim that for sweet little Elsie? Let's pray together. Gracious God, we bless you for Elsie, for who she is already, and for who she's becoming we thank you for every way that grace has gone ahead of her. Born to Adam and Courtney, who have just professed faith in you, invited into this worshiping community, and who just promised to love, encourage, and support. It's all grace. And we need grace if we're going to live into those promises so that Elsie would one day maybe stand with her older sisters on these steps and say, under her own strength, with her own tongue, I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. Be gracious to her and be gracious to us. Fan the promise into flame for her life. That you would help her in every way she might ever need help. That you would strengthen her for robust gospel living in the world and that you would uphold her by your victorious right hand. All of this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As a way of response, and as we prepare our hearts to hear God's word today, let's sing together, A Love of God, How Strong, How True.
I'd love to get right after it with you today. I'm calling our sermon journey the big, huge story of your whole life, which sounds like a great time. I'm, I'm really only trying to reflect what theologians and biblical scholars have been saying for a long time. One of my New Testament professors at Regent College when I lived and studied out there in Vancouver, B.C., Rick Watts, puts it like this. We're trying to inculcate God's story in you so deeply that when something happens, you just instinctively react with the character of God that's expressed in the story. Another way to think about it, it's who you are. It's so deep inside of you. It's just where you come from, the big, huge story of your whole life. And today, Esau and his brother Jacob, let me catch you up to their moment in the story. God made the world. Christians think God made the world out of nothing. But the catastrophe happened. We call it the fall. The world was sent spiraling in chaos, a spiral we experience still, but God is unwilling to allow us to spiral forever. He showed up to Adam and to Eve too, to Cain as well, an ark for Noah, and then to Abram. He promised a boy. He promised Sarai a son who would be Isaac, not only for their heart's desires and family's future, but for the good of the whole world. On that child would rest the hope of all the families of the earth. Isaac would grow. He would marry Rebecca, Isaac and Rebecca, Isaac and Rebecca sitting in a tree, and they would have twins. Esau, the firstborn, Jacob, the younger, Jacob, on the way out of the womb, grabs Esau's heel. A sibling rivalry history has yet to repeat. Listen to their moment in the story, a moment in the big, huge story of your whole life. When Isaac was old, and his eyes were growing dim so that he could not see He called for his elder son Esau and said, my son. And he said, here I am. And he said, see, I'm old and I do not know the day of my death. Now then take your weapons, your quiver and bow, go out to the field and hunt game, then prepare a savory meal for me such as I like that I may eat it and bless you before I die. Now, Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. And when Esau went out to the field to hunt game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father say to your brother Esau, go get the game, bring it, and prepare a savory meal for me that I may bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my word as I have commanded you. Go into the flock and choose two choice kids. Bring them to me that I may prepare a savory meal for your father as he likes. I will give it to you and you'll bring it to your father that he may bless you before he dies. And Jacob said, look, my brother is a hairy man and I'm a man of smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me and it will seem that I'm mocking him and I'll bring curse on myself rather than blessing. And Rebecca said, let the curse be on me, my son. Only do as I've commanded you, go and get them. So Jacob went and got them and brought them to his mother. And she prepared a savory meal for his father, just as Isaac loved. And she took two of the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and she placed them on her younger son, Jacob. And she took the skins of the kids and put them on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck, and she gave the food and the bread that she had prepared to her son Jacob. Now Jacob went in to his father Isaac and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? He said, I, I am Esau, your firstborn. I did what you told me. Now sit up that you may eat and bless me. And Isaac said, How is it that you found the game so quickly? Jacob said, the Lord your God granted me success. Isaac said, come near that I may feel you. So he came near and he felt him. And he said, the the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. 
And he did not recognize him because the hands were hairy like his brother Esau's. So he blessed him. He said, are you really my son? He said, I am. And he said, bring it to me that I may eat and bless you. And he brought him the food and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. And he said, come near my son and kiss me. So he came near to kiss him and he smelled his garments and he blessed him saying, ah, the smell of my son is like the the smell of a field that God has blessed. May God give you the dew from heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of wine and grain. May, May people serve you and nations bow down to you. May you be Lord over your brothers and your mother's sons bow down before you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. And after Isaac had blessed Jacob, when he had scarcely gone from the presence of his father Isaac, Esau returned from the hunting. He prepared a meal and he brought it to his father. And he said, sit up, my father, that you may eat and bless me. And Isaac said, who are you? And he said, I'm your firstborn, Esau. And Isaac shook violently and said, who was it then that came in with the game and brought it to me to eat? And I ate all of it and blessed him and blessed he shall be. And when Esau heard Isaac's words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. Bless me, me also, father. And Isaac said, your brother has taken your blessing away. And Esau said, he is rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times. First he took away my birthright, and now he takes away my blessing. And Esau said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac said, I've already made him Lord over you. All of his brothers will be his servants. I have sustained him with wine and grain. What can I do for you now, my son? And Esau said, have you no more blessings? Bless me. Me also, Father. And he cried out in a loud voice and wept. And Isaac answered him, See, away from the fatness of the earth shall be your home. Away from the dew of heaven on high. By the sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. But when you break loose, you will break his yoke from around your neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's Genesis 27. If you wanted to find it in a Bible near you. What kind of a story is this? God blesses Abram and Sarai with a boy named Isaac on whose shoulders would hang the hope of the whole world. And Isaac with Rebekah have two sons, Esau and Jacob, a story of deceit and lies. Rebekah lying to her husband, Jacob stealing from his brother. What kind of a story is this? Part of me just wants to throw up my hands and say, what do you do with this? And another part of me wants to lean in, press harder, look more carefully. So let's look more carefully together. A hint of a Guess of a forecast of a promise embedded in this Genesis 27 story. And then a shocking, wild, I did not see that coming conclusion. The hint of the guess of the forecast of the promise in Genesis 27, just to make it clear, no matter how messed up you think you are, no matter how jerry-rigged your family may be, no matter what you've done or where you've gone or the things you've said puts you outside the realm of God's redeeming possibilities, It's the hint of the guess of the forecast of the promise in Genesis 27, which the New Testament writers make clear. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. Or in a different place. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. The hint of the guess of the forecast of the promise embedded in Genesis 27 takes on flesh in Jesus Christ who takes on the mess of our lives, the brokenness and the dysfunction and the lying and the deceiving and the treachery and the violence. He takes it all on himself. He takes it with him to the cross where he announces, it is finished and you are forgiven. He brings it to the grave where he leaves it as he rises up in resurrection to rewrite your story. 
to re-narrate your life, the big, huge story of your whole life. He reclaims the drama for you. No matter how messed up you think you are, no matter how jerry-rigged you think your family may be, no matter what you've done or what you've said or where you've gone or any of the brokenness or dysfunction you know, shame you carry, does not set you outside the realm of God's redeeming possibility. That's what the Bible says. Let me try to make clear the hint of the guess of the forecast of the promise in Genesis 27. It actually happens even before Genesis 27. Genesis 25, 27. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter and a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac, the dad, loved Esau, but Rebekah, the mom, loved Jacob. Even before these kids had a chance. Even before they had a chance to work it out on the playground, a few skinned knees and a couple of bruised elbows, before they even had a chance, it was pre-scripted for them. Isaac loved Esau. Rebekah loved Jacob. They were sent in two different directions before they made any decisions. You ever feel like that? Ever felt like that to you? Not, not like your dad loves one sibling and your mom loves another, but, like, but your life's been like pre-scripted before you had a chance. Before you said anything or did anything, there was some sort of force pushing you, a kind of inertia, inertia drawing you along, and you're going along despite what you might choose for yourself. You just can't seem to resist the inertia. Ever felt like that? You got a friend, he's middle-aged, about 40, just like Jacob and Esau were in this Genesis 27 story, said to me not all that long ago, my entire life, I've just felt like something is wrong. They didn't even have a chance. It felt like things were pre-scripted. Uh, then Genesis 26, 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Basemath, daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Esau makes life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. And I'm just going to check in with parents now. Does it ever feel like that to you too? Raising your kids the best you can, doing the best you know how. You acknowledge maybe it's not the best there is, but you gave it your best shot. And for whatever reason now, there's this intense estrangement. The phone calls are intermittent and short. The family gatherings are tense and cold. The only reason you get together at all is because of some biological draw. Esau made life bitter. For Isaac and Rebekah. And God seems to be involved in this too. If you want to go back to Genesis 25, 22. Pregnancy was hard for Rebekah. She would rather die than deliver. That's what she says. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two people born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. God is somehow in this. I don't know if he was announcing to Rebecca, what he planned to do or just letting her know that it was going to go that way all the while. I'm wondering, what's up, God? What are you doing, God? Ever feel like that to you? What's up, God? What are you doing, God? Did you plan it this way, God? Are you just letting it happen this way, God? Why don't you do something, God? All of that before the mess of Genesis 27. Despite the fact that Esau made life bitter for Rebekah and for Isaac, Isaac loved Esau more. He just, I guess, loved food so much. He loved the hunter Esau. So in his dying days, he calls his favorite son Esau over. He says, here's what I want you to do so that I can bless you. And Rebekah is eavesdropping. The greatest case of spousal eavesdropping in the history of marriage. She's listening in. She hears the word, she, she goes to the son she loves, Jacob, and tells him how to do it and how to do it faster. So Jacob comes in. Rebecca costumes him. She gives him the hairy hands and the hairy neck, tells him how to lie, how to do it. Jacob resists a little but wants the blessing still. Jacob goes into Isaac, Isaac suspicious, Isaac curious, never suspecting really his son would lie and his wife would deceive. And we get the blessing. Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. And it goes on. 
And then as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his father Isaac, his brother Esau came in. Esau, bless me, father, me also. And Isaac says, my hands are tied. I've already given your blessing away. And then the story, as we've been telling it, ends like this. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. What kind of a story is this? It's hard to see the good news in Genesis 27. It's hard to see the good news amidst the lying and the deceiving and the threats and the violence. Sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? It's hard to see the good news in, in, in life, around the world. It can sometimes be hard to see the good news. I'm thinking of school superintendents and principals and administrators who put their best clothes on on Monday morning and that plastic smile they've been trained to wear all the while, the hurtful emails from over the weekend burning in their hearts. Sometimes it's just hard to see the good news. I'm thinking of the public health officials who are buying security systems for their homes because the threats are real and the rumors are flying. Sometimes it's hard to see the good news. I'm thinking of the, the teenage girl inundated by stories all the time telling her who she is and what's right and what's good and what's beautiful, confusing stories and competing stories all the while. She just wants to know, am I okay? Is it okay? Does anybody want to be with me? And we just give her a bunch of rules or maybe some money to get out of here. It's sometimes it's hard to see the good news. It's hard to see the, the good news in Genesis 27, the hint of the forecast of the guess of the promise. Un unless you're willing, unless you're able to, to, to zoom out just a bit, Genesis 27 is a moment in the story and we can't ignore it, but it's not the whole story. God showed up to Abram and said, I'll, I'll bless you and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. You'll have a boy, Isaac, on whose shoulders will hang the hope of the whole world. And Isaac Mary's Rebecca, and they have two sons, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob has a boy, Joseph, and on down the line it goes until finally, in the fullness of time, the promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus, who takes the whole mess of who we are on himself to forgive us and announces on the cross, it is finished. He goes to the grave. He rises up in resurrection to rewrite your story. This moment does not define the whole. This experience is not all there is about your story, the big, huge story of your whole life. Jesus Christ intends to rewrite it, re-narrate it, reclaim it. No matter how messed up you think you are, or how jerry-rigged you think your family is, or what you've done, or what you've said, or where you've gone, or the brokenness and the dysfunction and the shame you carry, Jesus Christ intends to redeem it. That's your story. So just real quick, let me get to the... Wild, shocking, I did not see that coming surprise of a conclusion. Rebecca, listening in again, listening in to Esau's thoughts, I guess, Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Rebecca hears the threat, so she says to her favorite son, Jacob, get out of here. You got to go. Flee, my boy. Go. So Jacob does. He runs. He flees. He goes to some family member of Rebekah's in some other village, some other place. And things go pretty well for Jacob, actually. He marries a couple times. We'll get to that a different day. He has some kids and some cattle. He's a pretty shrewd businessman. But as it went in his biological family, so it goes with his extended family. There's some more dysfunction. And Jacob does what Jacob tends to do. He runs. He flees. He got out of there again opening himself to the possibility of encountering Esau. Esau, out for blood. I will kill my brother Jacob. Esau, out to get him. And as God would have it, as Jacob runs, he encounters Esau. Again, he, he hears about him off in the distance. He sends him all kinds of gifts to appease his anger. Sends him his kids. Sends him his wives. Sends him his cattle. Genesis 33 Here's the surprise conclusion. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. 
And Jacob said, To see your face is like seeing the face of God. What happened to Esau? Esau, then I will kill my brother Jacob, now runs to him, embraces him, falls on his neck, and kisses him. God rewrote the narrative for Esau. God rewrote the script for Esau, a redemption story, a forgiveness story. Remember when Isaac blessed Esau, a sort of sad blessing? When you break loose, you will break his yoke from around your neck. When you break loose, Esau broke loose, broke loose from the need to retaliate and vengeance and violence, the need to go eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but rather to go the way of the gospel, even then to forgive, to go the way of grace, to go the way of peace, to see your face is to see the face of God. To be set free is not to go the way of retaliation and violence and revenge, but rather the way of grace and mercy and compassion. That's the way of God. He rewrites the script. He re-narrates the story for Esau so that the full, big, huge story can go on that culminates in Jesus Christ and the redemption of all things. That's the big, huge story of your whole life. On Thursday night, we launched something we're calling the Center for Marketplace Witness. It's our and effort to live out the benediction we offer on a weekend here at Pillar. You're about to enter every sector of public life to claim it for Christ. Our thinking is, you know, most of the time you spend is where you're working. So that's where you ought to be a robust gospel witness. So we're just trying to raise up robust gospel witnesses for the workplace. We watched a video in which Eugene Peterson made a cameo. Eugene Peterson's in heaven now, but I thought you might like to see just what Eugene had to say. One of the wonderful things to me about the Bible is that there there really are no heroes. They're all full of people like us that do stupid things. And, uh, And they're still in the story. Nobody gets ejected. You realize that? One of the things I love about the Bible, they're full of people just like us who do stupid things. But they're still in the story. Nobody gets ejected. No matter how messed up you think you are, no matter how jerry-rigged you think your family is, no matter what you've done or where you've been or what you've said or the brokenness, shame, dysfunction or whatever version of hurt you carry, does not set you outside of God's redeeming purposes for your life. You get to live according to the story, free, forgiven, free from the past you can't change, and open to the future in which God changes everything. God changes everything through his son, Jesus Christ, who loves you so much. He took on flesh. He became what we are so we could become like he is. He was with his friends one night, broke bread, blessed it, gave it to them, said, take, eat, this is my body, poured out the cup, said, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, to rewrite the story, to reclaim your narrative, to redeem your life. If you believe Jesus is Lord and acknowledge him as Savior, you're welcome to participate in this virtual way now. If you're not at that place, I'd love to hear some of your story, maybe wonder together about some of your questions, you can email me, john, J-O-N, at pillarchurch.com.
friends, you are about to enter every sector of public life to claim it for Christ. So as you do, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace.